Our Heavenly Father, we bow our heads before thee to thank you for all the many blessings that you've given us. We're thankful for this beautiful day and for this opportunity that we have to gather together with our brothers and sisters and friends of the truth to hear your word expounded. And we pray that what we learn today will sink deep into our hearts to help us to be more like your beloved son so that we might go out and demonstrate your characteristics like he did, that we might be able to show the, this world of darkness your love and your mercy and your kindness and this wonderful plan that you have for, for this earth. And we pray to me, Father, that by gathering together with each with one another, that we will help to build us, build each of us up in our most holy faith and to remember what is important. And we pray, dear me, Father, that they will soon come, that you send your son to return to this earth to establish that grand glorious kingdom. And our prayer is that if it be thy will, that each of us here might be found acceptable for a place therein. We pray all these things in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Thanks, David. All right. So a quick review. So we were in, um, obviously, in Hebrews chapter 10. And um, so the first you know, bit, we, we looked at the first 10 verses about the sacrifice of Christ and its superiority. And uh, sort of the big punchline of uh, the first 10 verses comes in verse 10, where it tells us that the real sacrifice of Christ was his will, that for 33 and a half years, he sacrificed his will to his heavenly father, um, and that we've been made holy through that sacrifice. Um, and, and really, I think the, the, uh, the encouragement is for us to follow suit, right? That we sacrifice our wills. That's the, that's the sacrifice that God really wants. We looked at um, uh, Psalm 40, uh, where he had talked about uh, where the, uh, the writer of the Hebrews had actually kind of uh, put it in quotes, misquoted um, uh, the Psalm. Uh, and, but the, the, that was the kind of the big point was what was the sacrifice and, and, um, uh, it was going back to that Hebrew slave that, um, loved his master and was willing to submit to his master willingly, um, for ever. And so, you know, that was kind of the big, the big point of, um, the first 10 verses of Hebrews, uh, one to 10. Now we're sort of transitioning and the, and the transition is, so what is that, you know, and this is a very, a very natural thing to ask. So, so what's in that for me, right? So what's in it for me? Jesus did this amazing thing. What's in it for me? What does that do for me? What does that buy for me? And so the, the next uh, seven uh, verses, uh, 11 to 17, um, kind of uh, sum up that um, what's, what's in it for me? How does this affect us? really? What does this do for us? And so why don't we read the next, why don't we read 11 to 17? Let's start off with the Sneeds. Y'all can break that up. You want um, to split it up. Uh, uh, Hebrews 10 uh, verses 11 to 17. <clears throat> Every priest stands daily ministering, offering time after time, the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But he, having offered one sacrifice for sin for all time, sat down at the right hand of God, waiting for that time onward until his enemies be made a footstool for his feet. By, for his feet, yes, you. For by one offering he has perfected for all time those who are sanctified. The Holy Spirit also testifies to us about this. First, he says, this is the covenant I will make with them. After that time, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their hearts and I will write them on their minds. Then he adds their sins and lawless acts. I will remember no more. Uh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Read verse 18 too, Jan. Sorry. It was for really verse 18 too. And where, and where these have been forgiven, there is no longer any sacrifice for sin. Okay. So we're going to do this a little differently. We're going to start um, at the end and then kind of go back because again, the writer of the Hebrews gives kind of the punchline, if you will, in the last set of verses there. And um, verse 18 says, and where these have been forgiven, sacrifice for sin is no longer necessary. So, so, so what? So Jesus did this amazing thing. He sacrificed his will for 33 and a half years. Um, he's resurrected, um, now sits at the right hand of God in power. 
so what? Well, what this says for us and, um, and sets up again, the, the, the going on to the rest of the chapter, it tells us, so if your sins are forgiven permanently, then there doesn't need to be continual sacrifices. That's kind of the point is you don't need to keep offering sacrifices over and over again because your sins are forgiven. Jesus, you know, Jesus uh, was, Jesus can forgive sins now um, because he could forgive sins while he was on earth. Um, he, you know, he would tell people that, um, you know, that your sins be forgiven and that people were very offended. The fact that Jesus would say something like that audacious and they'd said only God for, can forgive sins. And, you know, Jesus would say, so that you may know that the son of man has the power to forgive sins and he would heal or whatever. So that's the point, right? That, that we kind of live in a state of continual forgiveness and, um, we're going to, th this is going to be very important to setting up why we talk about the second half of this chapter, because really um, what, the, what the writer to the Hebrews does is basically says there's really only two groups of people when it comes to, um, you know, people that have, have been in Christ. And um, there's those people who are continually be forgiving. And these are essentially defined within the context that ch uh, chapter of people that are trying to sacrifice their will to God. Failing, because we all fail, but trying. And, and, and the, the, the really what the expectation is of God is that we try, that we, that we run to him, that we love him, that we try to obey him, that we trust him. And that we're, we're given an effort. And then there's a second group of people, which, you know, is, it comes in, in the uh, latter half of chapter 10 and verse 26 describes those people. If we to deliberately keep on sinning after we have received the knowledge of the truth, no sacrifice for sins is left. So there's two kinds of people. There's people that are trying and there's people that are um uh, not trying at all. They just said, I don't care what God has to say. I don't care what his teachings are. I'm not going to try. Um, these are people that just said, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to live my life the way I want to live my life. And I don't care. You know, they deliberately keep on sinning. They don't care what, what um, God had to say. So um, with that set up, and now you kind of see the big picture of where this is going and why this is important We'll kind of go back in um, the, 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 the verses um, uh, 11 to 18 and figure out the case that is being built. So um, we kind of already did, you know, the first couple of verses there. We're kind of about on verse 15. And, um, you know, the kind of the point of the first three verses was there encapsulated in verse 14 that, uh, for by one sacrifice, he has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. And so, you know, it's interesting there that it, he, he kind of ends it up by saying we're being made holy. Um, we are supposed to be holy people. We're supposed to be a holy people now. But the, 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 the process isn't complete. We all still sin. We all still fall short. Um, and, and the expectation of God is, is um, uh that, that we are going to sin and that we are going to need forgiveness. And he has made provision for that um, and has promised us. You know, what's interesting is to, um, well, let's, let's talk about forgiveness for a second. So um, in this, in this uh, uh, next couple of verses, there is this idea of, of forgiveness is put in here. So look, notice the setup here in verse 15. The Holy, Holy Spirit also testifies to us about this. First, he says, this is the covenant I will make with them. And after that time, says the Lord, I will put their laws in, in their hearts and I will write them on their minds. So I want you to notice this. This is from Jeremiah 31, 33. We don't need to go look at it um, right now because I want you to follow this point. The point is, this is what God wants from us. This is what we bring to the table, okay? He's going to make this covenant with us. It's a promise, if you will. It's a, it's a, 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 
a legally binding contract, if you will. I'll put their law, I'll put my laws in their hearts and I'll write them on their minds. You know, if you can kind of summarize things, this is one of those great summary verses about um, what God wants from us, you know. Um, you know, they, they asked Jesus what the greatest two commandments were, you know, uh, love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, soul, and mind, and then love thy neighbor as thyself was the second greatest commandment. And, and this is the sort of the same thing. Um, it's not, I will know God's laws. Of course, you have to know God's laws to follow God's laws, but it's not, I will know God's laws. It's, I'm going to put those laws in my hearts and in, 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 in my minds meaning that we're going to um, breathe these things in, take them in like that, you know, the analogy in the, in the Bible is um, where it says, man does not live by bread of love alone, but by every word that proceeded from the mouth of God. So it's that concept that, you know, the, the word of God sitting out here doesn't do us a whole lot of good. It's only when it's in our minds and our hearts such that we follow it and, and we obey it and it convicts us to, um, to act a certain way. So this is that's point number one. And then he says, again, in the context of this sacrifice, in this context of forgiveness in verse 17 of Hebrews 10, their sins and lawless acts I will remember no more. And again, that is also a quote from Jeremiah 31. So I want you to notice the language here. And this is Old Testament language, right? We're in Jeremiah. Um, you know, what one of the things that I think is the hardest thing for us to believe as human beings is God's forgiveness. Adam and Eve, they sinned, and what did they do? They ran away from God, they hid themselves, you know, because inherent in that is a, a, a lack of trust in what God has said that I will forgive you. And this has been a theme throughout all of um, the scripture. God says, I will forgive you. Look, I will forgive you. And we go, no, 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 we don't really believe you. But notice what he says here in verse 17. I will, rem I, uh, their sins and lawless acts, I will remember no more. Now, I don't think God forgets anything. God doesn't have, you know, blind spots. I, I forget a lot of things. I'll walk into the next room and I don't remember why I went. Um, but God's not like that. He remembers everything. But what he's trying to tell us there in this, in this um, uh, kind of poetic language, if you will, is it's as if you never even sin because I don't remember it at all. And that's, you know, think about the power of that. And, and we even kind of uh, when I say we, I mean Christadelphians, you know, um, and again, I'm painting with a broad brush here, not everybody, but, you know, we tend to paint the judgment seat as this, uh, this scene where, you know, God's going to pull us up there, uh, you know, in, in front of Jesus. And, you know, in my, my mind, when I was younger, you know, there's going to be this movie screen of all the sins I've ever done. And y'all are going to be sitting there going, oh, can't believe brother Kyle was such a horrid human being, you know, oh, what a scumbag he was. I can't believe that, you know, I'm sitting there going, oh, oh no, you know, and, and then, uh, you know, if, 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 uh, if I just happen to skate by, you know, Jesus is going to look at me after this ordeal and go, well done, my good and faithful servant. <laughs> like what, what, <laughs> you know, so that, that's, that's, that's ludicrous. That whole thing. God can't forget our sins and then bring them back up. He can't promise us that he'll forget our sins and then bring them back up. You know, God cannot lie. And so when he says, I will remember your sins no more, that promise we can take to the bank. Then when God forgives us, he forgives us completely and absolutely. And those things, and what is he looking for us? We're again, we're going to get to this in the next part of this chapter. He's just looking for us to try to make the effort. He knows we're going to fail, but he wants us to be trying and failing. And he wants us to be learning and, and growing and, and, and trying to do our, our, our best. That's what he wants. That's what he wants. This chapter is so powerful. That's why I was telling you, this is, you know, to me, one of the most powerful chapters in the Bible. And so, um, 
let's look at let's just look at a couple of these passages that um, um, that kind of say the same thing. Uh, uh, let me get uh, David uh, Pinkston. Let me get you to read uh, Psalm one hundred three twelve. Psalms 103, verse 12. As far as the east is from the west, so far hath he removed our transgressions from us. All right. So this is really a kind of a, a cool verse because, you know, I'm sitting here at my kitchen table and um, I'm looking right now, I'm looking north. You know, if I had north here and I was able to do this and just keep walking north, eventually what's going to happen? I'm going to start walking south. Because I'm going to hit the top of the world and I'm going to start heading down again, right? Then I'll walk down again and I'll start. So what's the difference between north and south? Well, at the North Pole, it's, it's nothing. You know, you move one inch this way, you're going south. One inch this way, you know, you're going south. You know, you, and then you head back, you're going north again. So, um, but what about east and west? And this, again, remember, this is, this is written, you know, a thousand years before Christ. Um, this, this, you know, uh, had to have an understanding that the world was at this point round in order for this uh, analogy to make sense, you know. So if you go east, what happens if you're walking, you're, let's say you're at the equator and you start walking east. You can go east forever and ever and ever. You start walking west, you can go west forever and ever and ever. And that's how far, you know, that, that God uh, removes our transgressions from us. It's infinite is the is the is the metaphor is the analogy it's an infinite um separation between us and our sins when god forgives us think about how powerful that is and, and if you ever you know i want you to remember this when you start to doubt you start to look at what a crumb bum you are and you know how sinful you are and realize god's forgiveness is is way bigger than, than that. And again, all he's asked is that we, is that we try. Um, Micah 7, 18 and 19. Debbie, can I get you to read that? That's Micah 7, 18 and 19. Who is a God like you, pardoning iniquity and passing over the transgression of the remnant of his heritage? He does not retain his anger forever because he delights in mercy. He will again have compassion on us and will subdue our iniquities. You will cast all our sins into the depths of the sea. All right. So, you know, this is a this is something that, you know, um, the, the Jews still do this every year, I think, on well, one of the feast days, I want to say it's a day of atonement, that there's a ritual they do where they will go and take a piece of bread and they will cast it into the water and, and let it drift off. And, um, you know, again, the, the, the symbology of that for the Jews is that that's what God does with our sins. They just, they just drift off. They just go away. And there's no expectation that that's ever going to come back. You know, you're just, you're just sending it out there to, 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 to go and to go forever. Um, it's never going to uh, uh, come back on you. So Isaiah 43, 25 and 26. Uh, Kathy, can I get you to read that? Isaiah 43, 25 and 26. And this is similar language to what Jeremiah says in chapter 31. It's quoted in Hebrews 10. Isaiah 43, 25 and 26. Yes, ma'am. I am he who blots out your transgressions for my own sake. And I will not remember your sins. Put me in remembrance. Let us argue together. Set forth your case that you may be proved right. So again, God tells us, I will not, I will not remember your sin. So um, brothers and sisters, uh, when, we, uh, when we start thinking about this topic of forgiveness, you know, I want you to just keep in mind, God has promised and God doesn't lie that he will forget your sins. He will blot them out. They're done away with. And this is what we're going to find out next. And we will, we'll, um, 
we'll continue with this thought, you know, I probably got about two more weeks to go through this thing and then we'll be done. But the, the point I want to prove to you over the next two weeks is this, that we stay, as long as we're trying, you know, there, let me back up for a second. There's all kinds of sins you commit, right? There's sins of omission, things we do. There's things of omission, things we should have done that we didn't do. There's big sins, you know, like killing somebody. There's, you know, little sins like, you know, uh, um, you know, whatever. Some pick something little. And, and um, there's all kinds of sins. And some of the times we sin and we're not even aware we sin. We're, I mean, just by a sins of, of, of omission, you know, oh, I was, uh, you know, watching TV when I should have been reading my Bible. I was, uh, I, I should have been uh, calling on brother so-and-so who's sick instead of, uh, you know, raking my yard or whatever. Um, we sin all the time. And there's a concept that floats around a lot that says, unless you confess that sin and repent of that sin in some sort of formal way, you're not forgiven. And, and, and I'm going to suggest to you that that's not true at all, that we live in a state of continual forgiveness. We live in a state of grace where we're forgiven abundantly all the time. And I'm going to, I'm going to try to prove that to you through the scripture. Um, and where we're, and, and, but, but that's kind of, I think, the point that he's get going to in Hebrews chapter 10. Two kind of people, people that are deliberately sinning and God says, you know what waits for you? Judgment. Awful, terrible judgment. And there's people that are trying. And they're, and, and they're, they're clean. They're forgiven. They're not going to have to answer for anything of the judgment seat of Christ. Because they have, those things, those sins are gone. So, you know, I know a lot of people that I've talked to over my years um, in, um, in the Christian I mean, talked to a lot of people that just dread the judgment seat of Christ. And, and I really want you to kind of get over that. Like, what is the difference that in the Bible? There's so many people saying over and over again, how long, how long, how long? And the question is, how long before you come back? I really long for the coming back of Jesus. And if you're dreading the judgment seat, how can you really truly long for the second coming of Christ? You got to have at least a little bit of dread over it. Um, if that's what your concept of, of the second coming is, is that you're going to stand there and you're just going to be dragged through the, your miserable life, my miserable life. Look, I guarantee you guys, um, one of the greatest blessings that comes uh, to me, and I'm talking about me now, of, of, of being associated with the Lord Jesus Christ is forgiveness, continual, um, overabundant, amazing forgiveness, because uh, I'm not a great guy. And I don't deserve to be in God's kingdom, but I hopefully I'm trying and we'll be there and we'll be forgiven. So um, with that in mind, um, we're going to um, jump into, um, uh, let, me, let me just put a pin in that because I, I don't know if I really made this point well enough, but let me make it again. So in the Old Testament, the, here's the contrast between the law of Moses and today. Under the law of Moses, there's a constant a cycle of sin, repentance, sacrifice, forgiveness. Sin, repentance, sacrifice, forgiveness. Sin, repentance, sacrifice, forgiveness. On and on and on and on and on. And that cycle was broken in Jesus. Not that the, the, the fact that we don't have to repent. That's part of the, the process for us. But we're already forgiven. If we're sincere and we're, if our heart, if we, if our, if God's um, laws at verse 16 are written in our hearts and written on our minds, if that, if that's true of us, we're forgiven. So that's the contrast between the two. Because remember, that's what Hebrews is, a comparison and a contrast. So there is, there's a cycle of, 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 um, uh, sin and repentance and uh, sacrifice and forgiveness in the Old Testament. And in the New Testament, it's sin, forgiveness, and then, you know, 
uh, repentance and trying because we're, we're forgiven because we're trying. All right. So with that in mind, let's uh, let's go to the Martins and let's read uh, verse uh, Hebrews 10, verse 19 through the um, end of the chapter, if you would, please. Hey, oh, not through the end of the chapter. Let's just let's stop there. Let's stop at verse 31, um, 19 to 31, and then we'll save the last little bit for so we got. Hey, hey, Kyle. Yeah. Uh, could I make a, a quick point? Yes, please. I think this might be kind of going along with what you're what you're saying, but in Hebrews uh, 10, verse 16, you know, this is this is basically quoting Jeremiah. And right. um, if you think about the old covenant, the old covenant was if you do this, God says, I will do this. So it was a if then kind of a thing. If you keep my law, I will, you know, give you bless you, bring you into the land, blah, blah, blah. It was if you do this, I will do this. If you do this, I will do this. And then if you don't do this, you know, then you had the negatives. Well, where in in Jeremiah the new covenant it says, um, it, starting in verse thirty two it says not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them out by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt which my covenant they broke see we couldn't do it if you do it then I'll do it well we could never do it but this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days saith the Lord I will put my law in their inward parts. I will write it in their hearts. I will be their God and they shall be my people and they shall teach no more every man his neighbor and every man his brother saying, know the Lord for they shall all know me from the least unto them and to the greatest of them saith the Lord for I will forgive their iniquity and I will remember their sin no more. So see the new covenant, it's God helping us through all this instead of right. us having to do it if then like the old covenant, it's God's now going to write these in our heart. God's going to, and, and it, it's, it's because of our faith and our love and our desire to be, you know, servants of his is how this is all going to be successful. So. Excellent. Thank you for that comment. All right, Martins, uh, you're on 1931. Okay. And, I'm, and just, just before you get started, I want you to notice 19 to 25 is one set of people. And then 26 to 31 is another set of people. And it's drastically different, the, 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 the state of these two people. So I just want you, to, as we're reading that, I want you to notice the power and the dramatic shift between these two sets of people. Thank you. Okay. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain that is through his flesh. And since we have great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith with our hearts and sprinkle clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us fast, let us fast the confession of our hope wavering for he who promised is faithful and let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. For if we go on sinning deliberately after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there is there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a fearful expectation of judgment and a fury of fire and that will consume the adversaries. Anyone has set aside the law of Moses dies without mercy on the evidence of two or three witnesses. How much worse punishment do you think will be deserved by the one who has trampled underfoot the son of God and has profaned the blood of the covenant by which he was crucified and has outraged the spirit of grace? For we know him who said, vengeance is mine, I will repay. And again, the Lord will judge his people. It's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of a living God. Do y'all see the, uh, the, the amazing contrast between these two sets of people? Uh, you know, which group do you want to be in? 
<laughs> is there is there a uh, is there a question? Is there any any doubt where we want to be? Um, you know, the, the 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 things that jump out to me when I read these verses is these. Um, I'm trying to think of right the right word. Um, these let's call them overcharged words. I mean, these words that are just you know, in your face, um, you know, like, for example, when he says in verse 22, um, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart, with full assurance, right? Full assurance. Um, and, you know, we have this confidence in verse 19 and um, verse 20, 29, how much more severely do you think someone will be punished as trampled on foot? So, you know, um, and then my first uh, verse says in verse 31, it is a dreadful thing to fall into the hands of a living God. So these um, these words, it's just, you know, he's, it, it's, it's kind of a verbal um, smacking us around a little bit, like wake up people, uh, wake up and smell the coffee about what's, uh, what's going on here and what your choice is. Um, I am getting the sign that we only have about a minute left. So let me just finish that with, uh, let me just kind of finish up with this thing, uh, with this point. So God has promised us, you know, he, he's going to forgive us. He's going to forgive us. Absolutely. Um, and then he's really boiled it down. You're in one of two camps. That's it. It's not, there's not some people that are going to kind of get into the kingdom. They're just going to slide in, right? They're just going to barely make it. There's there's, there's going to be sheep and there's going to be goats. There's not going to be sheep, goats, you know, half sheep, half goat. It's not, but whatever, you know, you're either going to be forgiven. You're either going to come there with your sins blotted out, or you're going to come there and say, you know, you're going to be that guy that stands before Jesus and said, and he's going to say, you know what? You said, you said, I, you know, the way you lived your life that you didn't care anymore, what God said about how to live. You lived your life the way that, um, that you did not care about God, you did not love God, you did not care about what I did for you, um, and um, you know you're going to get what you deserve. And so we, it's it's a real, um, it's a real stark. It's light and darkness. It's not gray. It, it's white and black, light and darkness, good and evil, and uh, we make that choice of where we're where we're going to be. So. Um, we're out of time for the week. I'm sorry it was a short thing with because of the, um, the technical difficulties we had, but we'll pick up there. And um, uh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I maybe have two weeks left. We'll see, um, but we should get this kind of kind of quickly because I think it's pretty straightforward. So, uh, uh, Brother Paul, can I get you to close with a prayer for us? Yes, sir. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much, Lord, for giving us this opportunity to, to learn from your word, Lord, and please uh, continue to bless Brother Kyle as he shares with us your word, Lord Jesus, and give him the wisdom as he can portray to us, Lord, and may, may we not just be able to hear it, but use this wisdom, Lord, that the forgiveness that you give us, Lord, that we will not deliberately sin, but please forgive our sins that we don't know that we do, Lord. Please forgive us and Keep us safe this week as we continue to learn about you and uh, try to keep this covenant, Lord, that we're so blessed to have. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Boy, thanks, Kyle. That was a tremendous class. Loved it. Thanks, Deb. Thank yes. you Good job, Kyle. Thank right, guys. you. See you, everybody. See you later. Bye.